people want to make this so complicated and they want to get away with the stupidest stuff like cooking all their food, pasteurizing all their foods, only eating out of a can, only eating out of a plastic bin. If you're not working towards a life where you're eating a whole natural, organic, locally raised food that's truly nutrient dense, you're part of the problem in this world. And you need to take a good look in the mirror and say, what really matters to me? Because there's no way around this being the superior paradigm. From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. Hey, Hilda here. A number of foods on the supermarket shelves are fortified with iron. We might not think this is a bad idea at first blush. Until we understand that most of the population is not iron deficient, but rather overloaded with iron. This is episode 384, and our guest today is Dr. Leland Stillman. Leland earned his medical degree from the University of Virginia, and he now practices natural and holistic medicine in Florida. He took time to discuss with us the ins and outs of iron. Virtually every disease of aging is linked to excess iron accumulation depression, anxiety, dementia, skin problems, liver failure, but our blood work might not show this issue. The thing is, iron is both a toxin and a nutrient, so it can be challenging for us to get the levels right in the body and even to assess what they are properly. Leland goes over which assessments work and which are limited. He also explains the nutrients we need, like copper and folate, that work synergistically to help our bodies properly handle iron. Finally, he tells us why donating blood to offload iron may not be the best solution. And he weighs in on whether cooking with cast iron pans is advisable or not. Before we jump into the conversation, I want to invite you to join us at the Wise Traditions Conference in Knoxville, Tennessee this October. Our guest today, Leland, will be there in addition to a number of amazing speakers, including, of course, Sally fallon the president of the foundation, Dr. Tom Cowan, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, and many, many other folks. I cannot wait to be there myself. Please join us. Go to wisetraditions.org and register today. And let me just tell you also as a side note, the food is out of this world. Of course, wise traditions friendly. And I want to give a shout out to Defender Shield. They are the world's number one EMF radiation protection and shielding company. And they just came out with an innovative line of digital wellness supplements called Light Body to complement their line of EMF shielding products. You know, we had Daniel Debon on an episode recently, number 379, talking about how we can protect ourselves from radiation. And one way to do it is from the inside out with targeted research-backed micronutrients that come in the Light Body supplements. They combat environmental toxins that our cells get exposed to daily. Find out more at DefenderShield.com, and when you place an order, use the code WISE10 for 10% off. That's DefenderShield.com and the code WISE10. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Leland. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I remember hearing you speak in Winchester and you were talking about iron and everybody was bowled over because we've been taught that we all are iron deficient, which is why mm-hmm. foods are iron fortified. Is that not the case that we're iron deficient? Help us understand what's going on here. Yeah. So iron is both a, a toxin and a nutrient. What people need to realize about iron is that it accumulates in the body. When you actually start to look at what people are really eating, you start to learn that people actually have a huge amount of iron coming in in their diet, even if they're vegan or vegetarian. What ends up happening and what people don't realize is that certain nutrients are necessary in order to turn iron into hemoglobin and also to get it out of cells and into the bloodstream and then to the bone marrow where it gets made into red blood cells. This creates the appearance on blood work, which is all doctors are used to ordering Mm -hmm. of an iron deficiency anemia. And because doctors are taught so little about nutrition, that's what it's considered to be like conventionally. And frankly, I see a lot of people in the integrative and natural medicine world 
who don't know anything about iron handling and how it really works, putting iron in various supplements. And it's a huge problem that's really underreported in the natural integrative functional medicine space. I got this right. It means that our blood work doesn't really indicate whether or not we have too much iron in our bodies. Yes, this is the difference between total body iron on the one hand and your blood levels of iron. And when I explain this to patients, because this always comes up, they'll ask me, well, if I don't have enough iron in my blood, doesn't that mean I should take more iron into my body? And I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's say that you're a billionaire and you happen to overdraft your checking account. This doesn't mean that you're broke. And the same thing is true of your body. Just because you've overdrafted your iron checking account in your blood doesn't mean that you don't have any iron in your body. What the body needs in order to handle iron properly are some combination of copper, vitamin A, B6, folate, B12, a bevy of other nutrients support it, but those are the main ones that are truly necessary for iron handling and for iron to be in its proper time and place. And it has to be in its proper time and place because it, when it gets out of control, it creates enormous disease and it can really lead to, I was just on the phone the other day with a young lady who's got iron overload due to a genetic condition, which many people don't realize this, but something like five to 10% of the Caucasian populace of North America has this mutation and they're set up for iron overload. And she, even at a young age, eating an extremely healthy diet, eating very little in the way of carbohydrates, being very active. She's actually a, a former professional athlete. She is facing massive iron overload to the point that her liver is actually has got significant disease. It's technically called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. She has to go donate blood in order to get all of that iron off. And this is something that a lot of docs are not aware of. A lot of patients end up unaware of. And it really is something that's in the blind spot, frankly, therefore of practitioners and patients. And it's so preventable. And that's why I, I wrote about it in my book, Dying to be Free. So let's talk about how we are getting so much iron in mm -hmm. our diet. You suggested that even vegans and vegetarians yes. get more than enough. Where is it coming from? Literally everything. People don't realize iron is, I think it's maybe the most abundant element in the Earth's core, or maybe the third most abundant element. It's incredibly abundant. It's everywhere. And this idea that we don't have enough iron or we're not absorbing it or or whatever, is really driven by the fact that the body just can't handle what we're bringing in because of micronutrient deficiencies. Now, historically, and the reason why we're so hang on to iron, and before I get any further into this, I really want people to know where I got all this information because mm -hmm. I didn't just make it up. If you go back and you read papers from the 19 teens, the 1920s, the 1930s, some of the first Nobel Prizes in medicine and physiology were given for research on anemias and specifically B12 and iron deficiency anemias, they didn't necessarily know that that's what they were at the time. But one of the Nobel Prizes was actually given to a series of doctors or a group of doctors who pioneered the use of beef liver for the treatment of anemia. Well, beef liver has a very small amount of iron, a huge amount of copper, a huge amount of vitamin A, and an abundance of folate, B12, and B6. So that's how that treatment worked to resolve these anemias. Oh. Fast forward 20, 30, 40 years, doctors get obsessed with drugs and completely lose interest in nutrition. And this information gets lost and washed out of the medical school curricula. It was preserved by some experts in iron handling and hematology, but not well disseminated. The books I read on this that blew my mind were Dumping Iron by P.D. Mangan. That's Paul Dennis Mangan, the full name. Iron, the Most Toxic Element by a guy named Jim Moon. That's J-Y-M. And then the current health and wellness influencer, let's just say, who really dialed me into this and, and taught me a lot about it is Morley Robbins. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah, who's, I think is going to be with us in Knoxville in October and is a very obstreperous former hospital administrator who had the audacity to think that he could figure out what lots and lots of doctors haven't. And he's light years ahead of most, even most integrative and natural and practitioners in his understanding of copper. I think he's too crazy about copper. He and I don't agree on everything. But I still like Morley quite a lot, and I have to give him a shout out because I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have taken this as far as I have if it weren't for him. Wow. So, are you saying that we get so much iron from everything because it's all over the place in the soil? And so, if we eat a carrot, it's in that carrot, and so forth. Yeah, life literally struggles to control the amount of iron in the environment. 
Are there places perhaps somewhere in the world that have truly iron deficient soils? Yes, I am not a geologist, so I don't know all about that. But I will tell you that as far as what we eat as modern people, we're getting a huge quantity of iron. You got to understand historically too, though, that this wasn't always the case, right? And iron really is a limiting element for us physiologically, but it's because we can lose it so quickly. So because iron is such a massive amount of our blood, you can lose huge quantities of iron very quickly. Like to give you guys all some understanding of the numbers here, right? If you sever a major artery or cut a major artery, you can lose liters of blood in minutes. A woman in childbirth has 20% of her blood flow or so directed to her uterus. If she's giving birth and one of those arteries starts to bleed, it gets ruptured because that vasculature down there is very prone to that. She can bleed out in a matter of minutes. It's one reason why having births in hospitals has cut the mortality rate for women from bleeding. Let's be very specific about that. It's cut their risk of bleeding to death radically. And it's because of our ability to maintain hemostasis so quickly. Historically, too, we also had a lot of blood loss just in day-to-day life. Men were engaged in war, combat. I mean, even just casually, men would fight several decades ago as a matter of course. And not to mention industrial accidents, farming accidents. I mean, it's life's been a lot more dangerous. It's been a lot more blood loss naturally in the past. So our bodies naturally want to hang on to iron because it's easy to lose your iron bank account, so to speak. You lose a couple of liters of blood, you may survive, right? But you just lost gram after gram after gram of iron in that blood that you lost. And you got to make that up in potentially a very adverse environment where you don't have an abundance of food. You know, imagine having a traumatic accident happen in a state of famine, right? I just said food is abundant in in iron, but we also take food for granted Mm -hmm. in our modern world where most people have never seen a grocery store shelf truly bare, right? Right. Women also historically weren't able to stop their menstrual cycles. They got them, they kept them, they petered out over time. Now women can use the birth control pill to completely, or they get a hysterectomy or they put it in some kind of IUD. All of a sudden their periods are much lighter or non-existent. They're not losing any of that iron over those years of their reproductive lifespan. And that leads to more iron accumulation. So we've really created the perfect storm for us to have maximal total body iron And the question then is, what is the optimal total body iron? That conversation starts with, before we even consider what the total body iron is, you got to make sure that the nutrients that the body needs to handle that iron are present in an abundance. Yes, I know what you're saying because Sally and I talk about this a lot. People get excited about just taking in a vitamin through pill form. And as you've suggested, that's not how it works in nature. That's not how it works in food. And we need the synergistic work of often even uh, fat soluble activators and so forth to help us absorb and assimilate and integrate into our bodies for its real use, that element. So iron needs the things you mentioned before, folate and B vitamins and so forth. So yeah, talk to us about what we need so that we can maximize our use of iron that's already in the body. Yeah. So all those micronutrients that I, I alluded to before, copper, vitamin A, B6, B12, folate. I mean, strictly speaking, any nutrient in the body can be rate limiting to normal physiology. I could go down the list of vitamins and come up with a way that someone who was deficient in that could have abnormal iron handling. In clinical practice, what I will tell you actually where the rubber meets the road and the patients get the tests and take the supplements and eat the diets, you're looking at a spectrum of different deficiencies for each patient. And that's why in my practice, you know, when you work with me one-on-one or with my team of health coaches, we're getting a wide array of different nutritional tests. We may look in your serum for copper. We may look in your hair for copper. We may look in your red blood cell for magnesium and potassium. It all depends on the case. It all depends on the context. And, you know, the other day I had a consultation with a young man who I got his labs back because he's been on testosterone replacement. You need to monitor their hemoglobin on testosterone because it will trigger red blood cell production and you can create, you can push people into too, having too high of a hemoglobin that can actually put them at risk for things like strokes or headaches or other complications. Men who are on testosterone need to give blood regularly. So I get this guy's labs back and his testosterone levels are great on his current regimen, but his hemoglobin levels are atrocious. I mean, some of the worst lab work I've seen in the last year. 
And I say to him, it's so bad that I say to him, hey, do you have a familial mutation in your hemoglobin? Do you have a thalassemia? So that's like the only thing that was compatible with his blood work. I thought this guy was eating a full diet, was not doing anything that would create this problem. And he says, I stopped eating red meat about 12 weeks ago because it was upsetting my stomach. And I really just switched over for the sake of convenience to dairy-based protein shakes. And I said, well, look, this is not working for you. You need a whole food, natural diet. You can't eat red meat. You need to eat some seafood for the folate, and the copper, and the selenium, and all the other micronutrients in that. You need to eat some nuts and seeds for the vitamin E and the copper and the B6. You need to eat some whole plants to get some the copper and the potassium and the magnesium. And I said, look, we could do an extensive nutritional panel. I'm going to tell you right now, I would recommend that. It's going to take more time between you and I. It's going to require an additional investment in your case of both my time. And obviously you're paying for my time. But at the end of the day, if you eat a whole food diet, all of this should go away. And we'll just recheck your complete blood count and see where it goes. And he decided he wanted to do that. And I have no doubt it's going to look a lot better. I also gave him some supplements that look, you should take some beef liver. You should take some B6. That's copper and B6 are probably the big problem given what you're eating and how your red blood cells appear. But that's the kind of thing that people will do. I remember years ago when some well-intentioned but misguided person, I'm tempted to say moron, but I won't, <laughs> decided he wanted to make something called like Soylent. And he was like, oh, I'm just going to add all the micronutrients and macronutrients that I need to this like drink or whatever. And I just remember thinking, this is going to end badly. Maybe not for him, but for somebody else. Because there's no way, and I love talking to you, and I love the Wise Traditions podcast and the Weston A. Price Foundation. And I did a book club on my Substack blog. It was the first book club I did was on Pottinger's Cats, or one of the first, by the second. And the reason I did it was because in Pottinger's Cats, they very clearly go through situations in which just cooking a food changes its nutritional content in a way that creates disease in these animals. People want to make this so complicated and they want to get away with the stupidest stuff like cooking all their food, pasteurizing all their foods, only eating out of a can, only eating out of a plastic bin. If you're not working towards a life where you're eating a whole natural, organic, locally raised food that's truly nutrient dense, you're part of the problem in this world and you need to take a good look in the mirror and say, what really matters to me? Because there's no way around this being the superior paradigm, especially pursuing this in this age of fake meat and the great reset. Because we're, we're not careful, then like Klaus Schwab is going to be telling us what flavor of cricket flour we get to make our pancakes with. And that's <laughs> the future I am on board with. Me either. Coming up, Leland discusses tools for assessing the mineral content of our bodies. You're listening to the Wise Traditions Podcast from the Weston A. Price Foundation. We pause now to recognize our sponsors. Upgraded formulas. A lot of us spend a boatload on supplements each month. Have you ever thought about how it might be good to know exactly how much of what you're taking is being absorbed into the body and incorporated into the right place? Would you like to know if you're missing any nutrients or getting too much of anything? It's time to test and not guess. Upgraded Formula has an upgraded hair test kit and consultation that helps you identify what deficiencies you may have that are affecting your thyroid, your adrenal function, and much more. I recently submitted my hair test and I'm going to meet with an expert soon to assess exactly what I have too much of and what I may have too little of. So go to UpgradedFormulas.com and save 20% on your first purchase with the code WISE at checkout. That's UpgradedFormulas.com and the code WISE. Tests don't guess with upgraded formulas. And have you heard about Optimal Carnivore's new Brain Nourish product? It's designed to improve focus, mood, memory, and provide better clarity and creativity. It's a unique groundbreaking formula that combines grass-fed beef brain and lion's mane mushrooms. It's the ultimate whole food, no tropic to build a better brain. And studies have shown that both ingredients are remarkable at improving cognition and brain health, both in the short and long term. You know, the mission at Optimal Carnivore is to make it easy for people to consume the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet. And they are batting 1,000 on this approach. Plus, they plant one tree for every product sold. So go to Amazon.com slash Optimal Carnivore and use the code Weston10 at checkout to receive 10% off all products. Definitely check out their grass-fed organ complex 
their grass-fed liver, and their brain-nourished product. Again, that's Amazon.com slash Optimal Carnivore and the code WESTIN10. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Now, Leland, I want to ask you, if we don't do a big panel, how can we assess ourselves, perhaps, the symptoms of toxic iron overload? Great question. So there is not a good test for this, by which I mean it is very difficult to assess total tissue and body levels of any mineral or nutrient. Because even if you look at the hair, what's going on in the hair reflects what's happened over the last several weeks. What does that mean for an organ like your liver that doesn't turn over every several weeks? The liver can regenerate. It's where most of the iron is stored. And I'm not going to run in and do a liver biopsy on everybody. That would be crazy, right? We don't have good therapeutic or diagnostic modalities to figure this out yet. I'm really excited to see where different types of MRI modalities go with this because it will be possible. And I think this is very feasible. I think one day we'll be able to do an MRI or some other kind of imaging study on someone and see and know what their mineral balance is. And we may be able to do it with light, you know, use a, a light, bounce it through the skin, the fat, the muscle, down to the bone and see how the light comes back and know things like, I mean, we already basically do that with DEXA scans, but yeah. the DEXA scans tell you the density, they don't tell you the mineral content. So to answer your question, because I know what you're looking for, you're looking for practical stuff that people can do right now. The number one thing that they can do is actually take a dietary history of themselves. And the way that I do this with patients when you work with me is we get a week of your data in an app called chronometer, which if you use the whole foods has something like 80 nutrients listed as far as the content. So it'll tell you the copper, the B6, the niacin, the manganese, the zinc. I mean, almost every nutrient I could want, I have one that they're missing that I wish they had will come out in chronometer data. And you can look at that and you can say, wow, and people find the most amazing things. They think, oh my gosh, I'm eating almost no potassium. or Oh my gosh, I'm eating tons of copper, but not a lot of zinc. And it's really helped me dial in patients' diets and understand or help them understand what, how they need to change their diet in order to have better health. And then what I do with my labs is I marry these two things together. I, I bring them together and I say, okay, your dietary potassium is, and this just happened last week, so I was a real uh-huh. example of a real person. Your dietary potassium is great, but your hair potassium is terrible. Why? This person was taking high dose vitamin D for years, her vitamin D level was over 100. It's well known in the literature that vitamin D depletes potassium. I'm by no means a skeptic of the therapeutic value of vitamin D, but it's a tool. And if you tell me that this tool is right for every possible situation of home renovation, I will try to sell you a bridge in a lovely little village called Brooklyn, (laughs) because that's nonsense. Anyway, that's the way I do it in my practice. And I have a wide variety of of testing. You know, we have very expensive and extensive panels that are hundreds of dollars, but then like my wellness panel that I do with patients, that's just 150 The list price for that would be if you went to like one of these direct labs places or consumer labs or direct consumer labs is what I'm saying. Their markup is hundreds of dollars and I extend my patients a much better price than I get. And then they have the benefit of time with me to actually review it. But it's not as simple, Leland, as noticing that a person has, let's say, joint pain or weight gain or something like that, you can't really pinpoint if iron is the culprit, right? No. And that's the problem with iron is that when you look in the literature, virtually every disease of aging is linked to excess iron accumulation in bad places. I mean, the people who develop full-blown iron overload, they develop mental health issues, depression, anxiety, frank psychosis, dementia, issues with their memory. They develop skin problems. They have a predisposition to get skin cancers. They go into liver failure. They go into heart failure. They may develop a certain amount of disease in their their lungs because of that. They develop diabetes. The men will have low testosterone levels. The women's sex steroid hormone levels will get deranged. They'll get overweight. I mean, the whole list of all the problems that people are selling wellness supplements and solutions for a lot of it is iron overload. And that's why it's so important to work with a practitioner who understands iron handling, because I just get patients in who have seen lots of smart people and no one's been able to figure it out. And I tell them to go donate some blood. And all of a sudden they're feeling better than they've felt in years. 
Yeah, I was going to ask you that if we should just proactively give blood and if so, how often? <laughs> so I don't recommend that. And the reason is that if you don't know where you are, like the, take, for example, this guy I just told you all about, he didn't realize he was anemic. He's profoundly anemic. He has two thirds as much blood as he should have. So if he hears on a wellness podcast, oh, the iron's a problem. You all have too much iron. Go out and donate blood. He's going to feel much worse. And women particularly don't realize how high their demand is for certain nutrients like folate, B12, because of their fertility, frankly. And so I'll find these deficiencies in women and it explains why they're fatigued or why they have headaches or why they're, you know, they have any variety of symptoms. And when we fix the folate, the B6, the B12, the copper problem first, then all of a sudden they're making red blood cells the way that they needed to. They're no longer anemic. And then we see what their iron stores really are. And then if they've got iron overload in the presence of normal red blood cells, and I mean normal in size, shape, and number, then absolutely you can do blood donation, right? But I've seen too many people feel terrible after blood donation empirically to recommend it empirically. I see. And so to get that beautiful synergy that we were discussing earlier in our foods, you were suggesting eat more seafood, right? What other foods are you like? Oh, these should definitely be included in the diet. Beef, liver, perhaps? I really want people to eat an extremely wide variety of foods. One of the things that patients don't realize is that the more of a food you eat, the more likely you are to become sensitive and allergic to it. This is well known in the allergy literature. In fact, if you want to create an experimental mouse model of food allergy, what you do is you force feed the animal its food as aggressively as possible. It's known as gavage, and it's basically torture, and it makes the animals allergic to the food. Well, what exactly is the difference between force feeding a mouse wheat three times a day and somebody who's panicked about their schoolwork or their job or making rent or the great reset or what Betty said about, wow, the way she looked in that dress or whatever, what's the difference between that person like choking down their breakfast, lunch, and dinner that's loaded with wheat, you know, while they're on the go, standing up, not taking time to relax, never seeing the sun, never being connected to the earth's electromagnetic field, not drinking healthy, wholesome water, loaded up with pharmaceutical drugs that break their normal physiology, What's the difference between that and force feeding the mouse with wheat three times a day? I think that's why we're seeing more food allergy or a big reason. And when you look at these cultures who don't even know what food allergy is, you describe like ulcerative colitis and they're like, that's weird. It's too bad that happens to you. We don't know what that is. Like when you look at these cultures, what do they all do? They eat an incredibly wide variety of foods and they don't restrict their diets usually at all. You know, if catfish is available, they eat catfish. If nuts and seeds are available, they eat nuts and seeds. And they don't just do what we do, which is like, oh, I like walnuts. It's the only nut and seed I eat. I've seen people mess that up. I've had patients come in with high selenium levels. And I say, hey, your selenium levels are high. And you eat a lot of Brazil nuts. And they say, you know what? Actually, there's five or six Brazil nuts at the bottom of every single side berry bowl that I have every day for breakfast. And I've seen people taking in 200 micrograms a day of selenium, which is a pretty normal dose. I've seen it in prenatal vitamins. I've seen it in multivitamins. I've seen it obviously in standalone vitamins. I've seen a selenium level in the blood of 500 in a guy who took that level of selenium for years. And he was coming to me wondering why he had diarrhea and fatigue and irritability. And I'm like, look, you have a toxic level of selenium. You have selenium toxicity. Stop taking 200 micrograms a day of selenium. It's like you said, people hear influencers or find out, you know, okay, acai is amazing for you, let's just say. Yeah. And so then it becomes their daily go-to meal and they don't realize they're causing themselves damage. Well, I hate to say this, but I have colleagues who don't test blood levels of minerals who put everyone on like 200 micrograms of selenium. I just had a colleague tell me, hey, I want this guy, I recommend this guy, this case that you have, take at least 100 milligrams of zinc a day. 100 milligrams of zinc is a whopping dose. Even if you eat a high red meat diet, you might not get to 20 milligrams of zinc a day. 100 milligrams of zinc is like five steaks. Oh and if you can do that and be healthy and well, awesome. But I find it really suspicious that two or three years ago, the carnivore thing took off like a shot. The carnivore diet's very high in zinc and very mm -hmm. low in copper if you don't eat liver. Two or three years into the carnivore craze, all of a sudden, everyone is recommending liver. Could it be 
that recommending the carnivore diet created this massive amount of zinc excess and copper deficiency. And now all of a sudden these influencers are figuring out, oh, I feel better when I eat beef liver. I don't even think they know this, but I'm quite confident that this is what's going on. They're normalizing the zinc copper ratio in their diets with liver. And they don't understand that they created that problem in the first place. And it's a big reason why people feel better on carnivore, I'm sure, out of the gate. They ended up copper toxic, particularly women will get to copper toxic because of the way their hormones affect mineral metabolism. And they'll have a blood copper of 150, 180, 200. Those are high, high numbers. If a woman comes in with levels like that, I expect her to have, and not always, because some women, it depends on what their hormones are doing and what birth control they're on and whatever. But I expect at that level for these women to have headache, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, lack of appetite, potentially abdominal pain, IBS symptoms, all those things go along to me with copper toxicity. If you get that woman off of a high copper diet, which is nuts, seeds, grains, legumes, vegetables, fruits, onto a high zinc diet, that's a carnivore diet, with adequate protein, which many of them are not getting, no wonder they feel better. And, you know, I just talked to Paul Saladino, the carnivore MD recently, and he was suggesting that the carnivore diet is something of an elimination diet. And so, in other words, like you said, if people leave the other stuff, then they feel better. But he has even begun to incorporate, obviously, raw milk, honey, fruits, because he needs some of those things that they're being offered, some of those micronutrients we were discussing earlier. Yeah, right. I mean... I respect that my colleagues are doing something extreme and teaching us through their experience, but no population of humans on planet earth has ever been truly carnivore that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. They've eaten a lot of meat. It'll be a big staple in their diet, but you don't find tribes who are like, we don't eat fruit. That's bad for you. You know, you don't hear how you're here. You don't see tribes being like, Oh, we don't eat those beans over there. Those beans have got lectins. They'll kill you. Right. But we do see them preparing them properly. I know. The key. You're you know, right. Forget. They say, I can't eat nuts and seeds. I'm like, well, what do you mean? And they're like, well, I had a half a cup of cashews yesterday and I felt nauseous. And I'm like, half a cup of cashews? Are you crazy? Try a half an ounce. Mm-hmm. Try stewing it for 12 hours in an instant pot at high pressure. Oh, now we tolerate it. Okay. Yeah. Very different People thing. People need to realize like their dietary habits in our modern world can be really crazy and make them sick. Well, I have just a couple more questions as we start to wrap up. One is, what about cooking with cast iron pots and pans? Is Mm. that going to hurt us or help us? So with cast iron pots and pans, it's well known that if you don't cook acidic foods in them, they're not going to leach iron out. And my recommendation to people is to cook with, I like stainless steel. I like cast iron. I don't cook acidic foods in them. And that's my, that's my, and I also like enamel cookware with its cast iron with enamel on it. So if I'm making like a pasta sauce, I'm using something like that. And if I'm like grilling a steak, I don't have any anxiety about doing it on a cast iron pan. You're not going to get a significant contribution of iron from that. Now, if you do something like a cast iron pan fried steak, and then you do a balsamic reduction in the cast iron pan, that's a no-no. You want to do the cast iron reduction in a pan that's either enamel, like a saucepan, or in a like a small skillet that maybe is cast iron or some kind of enamel coating. The other thing I wanted to ask you is, is iron fortification in some of our foods backfiring on us? 100%. Iron fortification of foods is, I think, one of the public health establishment's great crimes. And that what they're doing is they're effectively treating people for a disease that not everybody has through the food supply. They had no idea what damage they were going to do. And to the people who have this predisposition to iron overload, they're actively hurting these people. And the stakes for iron deficiency, as far as people being fatigued, it's very easy to diagnose fatigue and iron deficiency. Like I would have patients come in with hemoglobins of seven, eight, some really critically low numbers, but you find the problem and you fix the problem. But if you have runaway iron overload, sometimes these people come into the hospital and they're dying and there's irreversible damage that's been done. It's easy to come back from anemia. We are absolutely set up to do so because anemia has been, because of acute blood loss, has been such a chronic endemic problem for humans. But iron overload has not. And so I think it's awful what they're doing with iron fortification of the food supply. It should stop 
it should have been stopped a long time ago. Well, thank you for getting that word out. And it just makes me think whenever I see like this is added or that is added on a yeah, package right. of some food, I'm thinking I'm not going to get that. <laughs> I can just get it from the real food and probably yeah. be more likely to benefit my body. Right. Absolutely. I, I write about this in Dying to Be Free. I write about how public health experts have gotten one thing after another wrong as far as what to actually do and how they're completely missing some of the simplest, most impactful things that could be done to keep the public healthy. And it's why I really am not surprised to find all these people like the World Economic Forum and other non-government organizations and even so-called elected officials advocating for things that I know are going to fail. I know are not good for people. I'm convinced they're just trying to control the populace and create a nations of drones and zombies who don't really think or do for themselves and just blindly accept whatever they're told. Yes, a sick population is much easier to control. And um, that's quite unfortunate. But I'm glad you've written your book. I'm glad you've given us this time. And this is just like a sneak peek of what you're going to talk about at the conference, where you're going to have an extended amount of time and be able to take questions. So I look forward to seeing you there. I do want to ask you one final question, Leland. If the listener could do just one thing to improve their health, what would you recommend that they do? Wow, just one thing? That's yeah, so just one hard. thing. I know. That's so hard. What I do in my practice is so specialized and so tailored to every patient. It's so hard for me to deal with this level of like simplicity, something concrete. Yeah. I would say spend time outside in nature, connect to the earth's electromagnetic field and getting sunlight. That's beautiful. I'm going to go do that in just a little bit. Thank you for your time. And I will see you in Knoxville. Thanks. Looking forward to it. Our guest today was Dr. Leland Stillman. For consultations or to check out his blog or podcast, go to stillmanmd.com. And I'm Hilda Labrador, the host and producer of this podcast on behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation. You can find me and my resources at holistichilda.com. And for a transcript from today's episode, visit our website, westonaprice.org, and click on the podcast page. And now for a letter to the editor from a recent Wise Traditions journal from the summer of 2022. Catherine writes in and says this, The homemade formula recipe saved my grandson's life. His mom's breast milk was not enough no matter how hard she tried, and the baby was losing weight and had extreme reflux. The formula recipe helped him make a 180-degree turn within a week. Sadly, his pediatrician said it was dangerous even though she admitted that he is now thriving. Catherine, thank you so much for this letter. It really encourages us to know that what we're putting out there is making a difference. If you want to find out more about the homemade baby formula, just go to our website, westonaprice.org, and you'll see it right on the homepage. I'm pretty sure we've put a link there. And if you'd like to write a letter to the editor, just write us at info at westonaprice.org. In the subject line, put letter to the editor. You can give us a testimonial of something that's made a difference in your life. Maybe share a complaint or something positive about the podcast or any aspect of the Wise Traditions work. Thank you so much for listening, my friends. Stay well and remember that all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. On behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation, thanks for listening. We have many free resources to support you on your health journey. Visit WestonAPrice.org to find podcasts, articles, videos, and more. You can also find a local chapter near you for help in finding sources of great food. We invite you to support the Foundation's mission of education, research, and activism by becoming a member. Thanks again, and take care. Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice.